cracked pots. All right? That'll set the tone right there. God uses cracked pots. This morning, we're, we're entering a section of 2 Corinthians that I believe contains some very profound truths. I believe that 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 5 are almost as important, if not as important, as some of the other texts of like John chapter 3, John chapter 14, Romans chapter 7 and 8. It, it comes almost as important in those areas. And it does that in containing what I call life changing truths. If we read those chapters at a name, John chapter 3, John 14, John chapter 7 and 8, and then first or 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5, folks, if we study those chapters, if we read those chapters, we apply those chapters, it will definitely change your life. It'll definitely do it. This section that we're going to be looking at this morning and we're about to read, explains the process by which God releases his power among his people. Now I'm going to ask you to please stand with me, as is our custom here at Grace Baptist, and turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to read just two verses, verse 6 and 7. Paul writes there at the church to Corinth these words. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of those of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Verse 7, but we have this great treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of power will be of God and not from ourselves. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for this text that, we're, that we've just read. Father God, I pray that we take away and that you take away all the thoughts of what we're going to do afterwards and help us, Father God. Help us to apply verse 6 and 7 of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians in our lives. Lead us and guide us now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we talk about the truths in this text, I want us to really focus on three truths. The first one is, I want to talk about pots. That's us. I want to talk about the power. That's Jesus. And I want to talk about the paradox. That's the mistress, a mysterious process God uses to release his power in this world today. Now, the first truth is the plain pot. Humanity, my humanity, your humanity, is like an empty clay jar. The word clay jar literally means, as we read in our text, earthenware. It was a word used to describe plain, ordinary, run-of-the-mill pots. Now, I said that God uses crack pots, and, and that, that's you and I. So my definition of what a clay pot is in earthenware, earthenware, it's not a very complimentary thing, is it? But this is, is a good analogy of our lives. Because, see, the Bible tells us over in Genesis chapter 2 that when God made man, he formed him out of the dirt or the clay of the ground. And, the, and as you go through your Bible, there are many references in the Bible that speaks of God as the master potter and we are the clay. For example, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, we read this, We are the clay and you are the potter and all of us are the work of your hand. Now I need to tell you a story, a true story. I'm going to tell you that right now. Some years ago, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I met a gentleman, a man that loved God, loved the Lord with all his heart, he and his wife both. His name was Skip Gray. Now, this is going to tell you a little bit about them. His name was Skip Gray. His wife's name was Buzzy. 
Now they loved the Lord, they, they were committed to walking with Christ, and they were also committing, committed to helping other people walk with Christ. But Skip and Buzzy loved to have fun. And they wanted people to know, as Christians, we could enjoy life. Well, Skip used to live in Florida, and one day he got a phone call through a friend of his who was the associate pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, and we all know that's where Dr. D. James Kennedy spoke or preached. Skip was asked if he would fill in Sunday night service for Dr. D. James Kennedy. Skip told us that he was beside himself, and he said it didn't take him but a half of a second to say yes. So he gets down to Core Ridge, and he sits in that morning's message, and the associate pastor preaches. And then they have, you know, they break and they leave, and then they come back for Sunday night, and Skip is going to preach Sunday night. And he said, of course, he said he's wearing this long robe. He said, which totally was out of character for him. They did all the music, they did all the announcements, they did all the other stuff. And if you've ever watched Pastor D. James Kendi, when he was alive and with us, you knew that he climbed up into the pulpit. It was up high. And so Skip climbs up there. And he tells us that he looked out over the church and he said there's just thousands upon thousands of serious faces looking back at him. <coughs> and living up to his name, he said, you know, he said, we just need to break the ice here. We need to show these folks that we're going to have fun. And here was his second, our next comment. He said, well, Dr. Kennedy's assistant preached this morning's message on the topic of psychosomatics. He said, this evening, to carry on that theme, he said, I will be preaching on psychoceramics, how to help a crackpot. He said the, bat, uh, the Presbyterian Church all laughed, they loosened up, and he said we had a great time. So this morning, I'm going to follow suit of Skip Gray, and I'm going to preach on how God uses crackpots. All right? Jesus said in Go John's Gospel, the 8th chapter, the 32nd verse, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, here's a liberating truth. God did not create you and I just to be a decoration. He created us to contain something valuable. Now, a pot or a vessel is designed and are created by that, that potter's hand to hold something valuable and not just to be an object of and in itself. Now, consider for the moment a pot in your kitchen. Ladies, you have all kinds of pots in there. And as long as they just sit there simply empty, they are not really fulfilling their purpose, are they? Their real reason and their real purpose is to fill with water and to make mashed potatoes or make spaghetti, make whatever. It holds something special. And in the same way, our lives are a contradiction until we understand that God created us to contain something valuable. Now this morning, and I thought about this, but decided not to do it. Let's say there's a table right here, and there's three pots. The first pot is, is a piece of pottery that's been, been fired and glazed and painted, and it's beautiful. We would even say that it is a decorative piece, and it just sits there. Maybe it's in your house on a special place in the cabinet or, or on, a, on a shelf somewhere. And it calls attention to itself because it's such a beautiful piece of pottery. Now, I have to say this. It reminds me of some people who think they are doing God a favor by just being around. Have you ever met one of those? Boy, they just think they're doing God the greatest thing in the world because they just came to church. Or they came to Sunday school and, and God ought to just be up in heaven going, oh, thank you that you came. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God did not create you or I just to be a decoration. He created us to contain something beautiful. 
And I'm going to get to that. Now, the second pot, is if we had it on this table, a little bit plainer than that first one. But, it, but it's doing what a pot is designed to do, and it's holding something. In this case, it, it's, let's say it's displaying some beautiful roses. Now, the beauty of the roses draws attention from the pot. We may look at the pot for just a few seconds, but our gaze, our, our, our amazement looks at those beautiful flowers. On that table, the third pot is a crack pot, which I'm going to talk a, about n- nearer to the end of my message. But for now, I want us just to look quickly at those first two pots. The first pot, God did not, like us, he did not create us just to sit around and look nice and call attention to ourselves. Instead, God created you and me to to be a plain pot. Some of us are crack pots to contain something beautiful, and that beautiful is God himself We have because we have the Holy Spirit of God within us. Amen? And that's what we contain. And see, people should not be looking at us. The attention should not be drawn to us. The attention should be what's inside of us, and that's the Spirit of God. There's a great story from the life of Elisha that illustrates this point. In 2 Kings chapter 4, one of, one of Elisha's friends dies, and he leaves a widow with two sons, and the widow is penniless, and the debtors, the collectors, are coming to claim the two boys for slaves to pay off the bill. And Elisha asked the lady, he says, what do you have in your house? And the widow replies, all I have is a small amount of olive oil. Now, ladies back then, they didn't use olive oil, olive oil just for cooking, okay? And Elisha said, now, here's what I'm going to do, and and I'm paraphrasing. I'm doing Valley's paraphrasing, but it goes along with the Bible, I promise you. Elisha says, go round up all the empty jars you, you, you can find. He said, matter of fact, go to your neighbors and don't just ask for some small jars. Ask for as many jars as you can possibly get your hands on. And then take those empty jars, those empty clay pots, and start pouring oil in each one. Remember the story? And when the one is filled, set it off to the side and keep pouring the next one. And keep doing that. So the widow starts filling up her empty pots, empty clay pots in her house. And she starts pouring the oil into every single pot, and then they they become filled to the brim. And when the last pot is filled, she told her sons, she said, go get some more. And they get more empty clay pots, and she fills those. But there was no more to fill, and, and at that moment, that's when the oil ran out. Then she told Elisha about the miracle, and he said, now sell the oil, pay your debts, and live on what's left. Now, I believe that there is a parable for every miracle and a miracle for every parable. Folks, those empty clay pots represent you and I. And when you read the Old Testament, when it talks about oil, that is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And when we present ourselves to God as an empty clay jar, an empty clay pot, then he can fill us with his Holy Spirit. And I believe like that day when that lady was was filling all those empty clay pots and she was looking around for more, Folks, I have to be honest with you and tell you today that we live in a time when I believe the eyes of the Lord is running throughout the earth and he's looking for people who love him enough to offer their lives to him as an empty clay pot so he can fill with the Holy Spirit and use them. I believe that. The second truth is this, the precious power. Now Christ lives, now I want you to listen carefully here. Christ lives in you and me like treasure in a jar. Okay? Note again that in our text it says we have this treasure in in jars of clay. 
Now, we've all heard the old saying, you cannot judge a book by its cover. We've all heard that. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the same is true with people. You cannot always tell a person by their appearance. The plainest, most uncommonly clay jar contains the priceless treasure of the life of Jesus Christ, and that's in many people today. When I was in the military, we had a young guy that was part of our ministry. And to look at this guy, you would just go, oh my goodness. He was not in appearance one of the good ones, okay? He was a really a crackpot. Always disheveled. And I remember some of the guys in leadership, they always thought, man, John will never, never, because of the way he is, the way he dresses, the way he does things, can God really use him? And it's amazing how God does because John got orders to go to England. And he got over there and he got involved in a Christian ministry. And God used that disheveled, serious crackpot to bring one Air Force man or woman to the Lord like none before. But at the base I was at, some of the leadership were always discouraged about how John looked. That he was just so plain that he was always just shuffled in his looks and appearances. But folks, it just shows us that God can take those plain Jane, and I'm not just meaning women, but plain Jane crackpots and use them mightily for the Lord. Here's another one of those liberating truths. Now listen closely. We can never successfully imitate Jesus all the time. But we can contain and display the life of Christ in us. Here's what I mean. Christianity is not following a bunch of rules and it's not trying to imitate Jesus. Trying to, if we were to try to imitate Jesus in performance, it is a performance-based religion then. And it only produces for that person misery and failure. I love it when people wear, you remember when the bracelets were popular that said WWJD? Used to love to see people, men and women, boys and girls, walking around with that. But then it made me think. And I know it's a reminder for them to ask themselves, well, what would Jesus do in this circumstance? And when people wearing the bracelet tried to do what Jesus would do, the question comes up, and if they realize it, that in their own human body, they have limitations. Limitations involved in answering that question, what would Jesus do? And that will take us only so far. For instance, when you ask the question, what would Jesus do? You and I are assuming that we know what Jesus would do in a given situation. And how many times have we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus would do something totally different than the norm? Totally different. We ourselves read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see the lives of Jesus Christ, and we see him in a certain situation, and we would probably even think to ourselves, well, if I was him, I would do... And Jesus does the total opposite. He does the total opposite. So how can we know what Jesus would do? Because he's God and he thinks higher than we do. And his ways are different than our ways. So I'm not sure if I know what Jesus would do sometimes. And like I said, even if I did know what Jesus would do... What makes me think that I would do what he did? Let me give you an example. You'll all remember this story. One time Jesus was in the boat. You remember he got with his guys and he said, let's get in the boat and let's go on the other side. All right? And Jesus is tired. He's human. He's tired. So he gets into the boat and what does he do? We all know. He lays down and takes a nap. 
And halfway across, here comes a storm. The winds are blowing. The water is coming up over the sides of the boat. And here's the amazing thing to me. A, the, a majority of the 12 are fishermen. They've been out on that river, that lake. They should have known better. But they look at Jesus, and I can just visualize them in my mind. They scream at him, and they go, we're about ready to drown. Now, let's, let, let me play this out. Okay? They yell it at him a couple times. And have you ever had somebody wake you up by yelling at you? You're not the most intelligent person in the world at that split second. I know I'm not. But here's Jesus, and he gets up, and he wipes his eyes. And he goes, what? What did you say? And I, I can imagine Peter being the ringleader. He goes, we're about ready to die. And what does Jesus do? He stands up, raises his hand, standing in the wind now with the water still coming, and he says, peace, be still. And everything was calm. Now, I want to finish the story from the gospel. Jesus looked at the guys and he says, you don't understand. I didn't say, let's get in the boat and drown. I said, let's get in the boat and go on the other side. And he was in the boat with him. Okay? So now, if we would do what Jesus did, almost use some improper language and said do, but if we would do what Jesus did, the next time a storm comes through your community, I hope and pray you're a little bit smarter than going out into the harsh wind with all the lightning and the thunder and everything else, and raise your hand and say, peace, be still, as he did. I'll pray for you. I'm not going to do that. All right? So there's some things that Jesus did that we cannot do. And I was singing that little bracelet, WWJD, and I, thought, I came up with something else. I thought, I, I like this. WWJDIM. Okay? You ready? What will Jesus do in me? I thought, I like that better. Because sometimes I don't know what Jesus would do. I may think I know. But like I said, there was times in his ministry on this earth that he did things that surprised many, many people. Paul the Apostle makes it clear in, in a verse, we'll be uh, talking about, in our next time together with the Lord here in the church. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul writes this, always caring about in the body the dying of Christ so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. The focus cannot be on the clay jar. It must always be on the treasure within the clay jar. The apostle Paul, you'll remember that he called himself the chief of sinners. Yet he wrote the secret of effectiveness was Christ in you, the hope and glory. And just as this second pot contains and, and presents those flowers we're saying over here on this table, for our enjoyment, so God made us to contain and display the wonderful life of Jesus Christ. Now here we come to that third pot, or the third truth. The puzzling paradox. And I believe that God delights in using imperfect vessels. I really do. The older I get in Christ, the more I believe that. And, and we all know that the Bible contains several examples of these paradoxes. Remember Jesus said, in order to live, you must die? Now that's a paradox, isn't it? In order for me to live, I must die. Another puzzling paradox is that God chooses to use imperfect, flawed, cracked pots. You and I. But the reason why God uses imperfect people is seen in the final words of our text. Here's why. So that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Who gets the glory? 
Not us. He does. Now, unfortunately, in this world that we live in, many of us have established a what I call a pecking order. And when we establish the pecking order, we tend to place people in social levels based upon their wealth, their education, or their status in life. And we think that our place is right here, and sometimes unconsciously, and sometimes consciously, we place other people here, don't we? But every once in a while, you know, so we don't look too bad, we put some people up above us even. But we do that. But let me say this. At the ground level, at the, at the, at the foot of the cross, folks, we're all equal. And Jesus reigns, not us. I think, and I believe that it's part of God's sense of humor, and I believe God has a sense of humor. I believe that every morning when I get up and go in my bathroom and look in the mirror and shave my face, God, you've got to have a sense of humor. But I think it's part of God's sense of humor that he often chooses to use that unlikely person to carry out his plan. I had a friend of mine down in Texas that used to say this, God can strike a, a, a mighty lick with a crooked stick. You ever hear that? Remember the first time Howard said that, and I just kind of gave him this look like, I don't understand what you're talking about. And Howard was a true Texan, and his comment was to, under, to explain to you non-Texans he said, what I'm saying is that God Almighty can use frail, fragile, cracked people to accomplish his plan in this world. And then I thought, okay, that makes sense. Why didn't you say that in the beginning <laughs> except for that, you know, that other way? And God calls all kinds of people. But I believe that he delights to use those that the world considers a little inferior to use his great plan. If you'll remember back, our early Christian brothers, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, what were they were called? They were called the unlearned. Yet God used that ragtag bunch of believers, according to Acts 17, 6, to turn this world upside down. See, in Acts 4, 13, where they, they were, the, the disciples were called unlearned, but it also goes on to say that they knew that they were with Jesus. Okay? The great apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth to remind them of the kind of people God uses. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, let's look down at verse 26. Paul writes to there at the church at Corinth and to us, he says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, and the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. God chooses many times some very weak people to do his great work. Here's a liberating truth. A cracked pot reveals much more of God's life, of his light, L-I-G-H-T. We read that the same God who said, let there be light at creation is the same God who made his light shine in your hearts and mine. And a cracked pot allows more light to be seen, doesn't it? Dr. Harry Ironside wrote this truth. He said, in order for a light to shine out of a vessel, it had to be broken. One may know all about the ways of light, 
and yet never communicate light to others because that one has never been broken in the presence of God. I thought I liked that. In another one of those great stories from the Old Testament to illustrate this point is over in Judges chapter 6. In Judges chapter 6, we meet this guy named Gideon. Okay? And let me set the stage for you. Gideon is in a wine press. That's where he's at. Okay, and let's look at starting in verse 12. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now, wait a minute. Where was he? In a wine press? And this angel is calling him a, a valiant warrior? Then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has these, all these things happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our father told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the, hands of, of the hand of the Midian. And the Lord said to him, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Then he said to him, O oh Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my father is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat many as one man. Now, Now, if we stop there and we go over to Judges chapter 7, there we would find that Gideon gathered an army. In Judges chapter 7, he gathers an army of 32,000 men. And I love this with God. God says it's too many. Too many. Here's why. If they win that battle, they will think that they did it by their military strength instead of by my hand. Now, if you read Judges 7, God says, or God tells Gideon to tell the soldiers, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return home. If they're afraid, if they're trembling, just go on home. Now, they have 32,000. Guess how many leaves? 22,000. That leaves Gideon with 10,000 soldiers. Now in verse 4, God says, still too many. They might think that they are responsible for victory. Let's trim it down again. So Gideon told the men to let's go to the stream and drink some water. Remember that story? And God said, every man who gets down and laps water on all fours like a dog, send him home. Keep only the ones who kneel and uses their hands to drink. Now we have 10,000, Gideon and 10,000, right? Then they do this, 9,700 goes home. It's Gideon and 300. God says, that's a great number, 300. This way, when you win against the overpowering odds, everyone will know that it was by my power, not yours. So at God's direction, Gideon and his band, they waited until midnight, and then they quietly surrounded the camp of the Midianites. And each soldier was given an, now listen what they were given, an empty clay jar, a torch, and a trumpet. They placed the, the torch inside the clay jar, and at a given signal, all the soldiers blew the trumpet and smashed their jars, and here's what they shouted. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the Midianites were awakened in a panic at the sound of the trumpet and the crack and the breaking of the jars and the shouting, 
and they were so confused that they started fighting one another. And those who were not killed from within, what did they do? They fled in the night. And there was victory. Now let's notice that the light of the torches of those 300, it was not revealed until they broke the jar, the cracked pot. That is what God wants to do, folks, with you and I to let His light shine through us and God delights to use cracked, flawed crackpots so that He and He alone will receive the glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, I like this in the Living Bible or the Living Translation. Here's what it says. If you look at us, you might well miss the brightness we carry this precious, precious message around in an unadored clay pot of our ordinary lives. That is to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power to us. So let me tell you this morning. Okay, you ready? If you are a cracked pot, don't despair. Okay? God delights to use cracked pots. Just like a light shines more through a cracked pot, so God shines more through the cracks and the flaws of your life. Because here's what happens, folks. If you and I are all perfect, like that first pot we had over here, that's been made and fired and glazed and painted and everything is just perfect, and we go through light, life and we look that way like that first pot those other people out there are going to go I can't compare they can't relate to my life and the heartaches of my life and the struggles in my life but folks when we're plain cracked pots and we can talk to the other plain cracked pots out there the lost ones the light of Jesus Christ shines through us and they say they can relate to me and my situation and we have a better relationship with them to share the gospel I said before that God I believe he delights in using the weaker things of life and people of life one amazing missionary to read about is J. Hudson Taylor Hudson Taylor was one of the first missionaries to take the gospel into China. Now, Hudson Taylor was a very sickly man. Even as a young boy, he he had very poor health. But he had a desire, and he knew that God was calling him to China to spread the gospel. So Hudson Taylor went to China, and God used this man. He used this weak man And he was just a plain clay pot that God filled with the treasure of Jesus Christ. And Hudson Taylor had a wonderful impact on the Chinese people and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Taylor once wrote, all of God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on Christ living in them. Now, if you ever read about Hudson Taylor, you'll know that Hudson Taylor was too humble to call himself a giant. But he understood that puzzling paradox that God uses the broken and cracked weak vessels. Now, brothers and sisters, let me leave you with this. It is okay if you are a cracked pot, just a plain Like the clay jars that Gideon and his soldiers broke, there is a a tremendous value in being broken. In our society today, if something breaks, what do we do? We just throw it away. We get rid of it. But God, I believe, cherishes broken people. God uses broken things, 
And, I, and, and as I was doing this, this message, I started thinking about the life of Jesus Christ. And I started coming up with, with things that he broke or that was broken. Jesus took, you remember this story? Jesus took the five loaves from the little boy. And what did he do? He broke them. He broke them and gave them out to the people and it multiplied. And everybody was filled. He wants to multiply our effectiveness. But he can only do that when you and I are broken. When we quit thinking so much of what I can do, and I can do it myself, and I need no one else, he needs us to be broken so we say, Father, I need you to do whatever in life. I think of Mary. Mary brought an alabaster jar of perfume, very, very expensive. But it was only when she broke that, frag that jar, that alabaster jar, that the fra fragrance filled the house, it says. And when you and I are broken, the fragrance of Christ can be detected in our lives. Just like when Mary broke that alabaster jar and that smell, that, that aroma just permeated throughout the house. And no matter where you were, you smelled that wonderful fragrance. Folks, when you and I are broken and Christ is using us, you can go by non-Christians and they know there's something different about you. They can sense it. They can almost smell it. You as a broken, cracked pot permeating Jesus Christ, the fragrance of the Lord, when you walk by another Christian, they can tell that they're in the presence of a brother or sister in Christ. I think the greatest of broken things of all is when Jesus said, this is my body which was broken for you. So, broken down, plain, cracked pots, if that's you, rejoice. Because God uses cracked pots so that he and he alone will get all the glory. And isn't that what we're to do? Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, I don't know how many all put together Everything in order, pots are here this morning, are listening this morning. But I know in my own life, Father, sometimes I feel just like a plain old clay pot that's sitting there. And sometimes I even feel like an old plain pot, a clay jar that's even a little cracked. Father, I thank you for that. And I pray that you use this old, plain, cracked pot for your glory. And for those that are here this morning and those that are listening, Father God, if they think, man, I'm nothing but a plain, cracked pot myself, let's praise the Lord together. Because when our life is cracked and we know Christ as Lord and Savior, more of Jesus will shine out into the darkened world. Father, lead us and guide us, I pray, to do your will. In Jesus' name.